Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Dr. Harb Brian Ferguson. He is Professor of Anthropology at Rutgers University in Newark. His expertise lies in cultural anthropology, the anthropology of war, ethnic conflict, state-tribe interaction, policing, and Puerto Rico. Dr. Ferguson has published many papers critical of biological perspectives in anthropology, especially explanations of war. And today we're going to focus on his new book, Chimpanzees, War and History, Are Men Born to Kill? So, Dr. Ferguson, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So, let me start by asking you a little bit about the history of the belief in a deaf instinct and aggressive drives. So of course, we have major intellectuals in our Western history, particularly like Freud, Raymond Dart, Conrad Lorenz, and more recently, Richard Rangham, who argue for this kind of thing. Sometimes they call it a deaf instinct, like Freud, for example. Other times they mention things like aggressive drives, being prone to war and violence, stuff like that. So could you please give us a summary of where those ideas come from and perhaps what you think is flawed about them? Well, there are many, many such ideas, and they go back into the mists of time. I think you can find roots in Greek philosophers. Um, but I pick up more recently than that, um, there, the, the debate over human nature in war is um, a little broader than even the question of whether there are innate tendencies to war. Like, for instance, you could talk about Hobbes, uh, who talked about uh, war and the state of nature of men being prone to violence when there's no thing there to prevent them from doing so. Uh, but it's not that they are, have an instinct to kill, it's just that they're going to pursue their own interests, and that will lead to violence. If you move it up, the question that I've been more interested in is when you bring in a psychology and a psychological tilt in the direction of violence. And that goes back, you can find a lot of it in the late 19th century, uh, one that you didn't mention was a very prominent psychologist at one time, McDougall, uh, who wrote about an instinct of pugnacity. Uh, and that's why tribal people fight each other just like a room full of children will fight each other. Um, Freud was given prominence in this because Einstein asked him a question which became publicly known as why war? And... Einstein thought that there had to be some kind of innate lust for depravity in human beings, and that's why we do such horrible things very often. Freud came up with his own answer, which was the, um, the death wish. Uh, and the death wish sounds kind of antique now. He had an idea that uh, organic life had a, and humans had a will towards self-destruction, which isn't very good for getting along and being alive. So it was turned outwards um, to others. Uh, and that's where the uh, lust for destruction that Einstein referred to came from. But that doesn't seem to have uh, many, if any, followers today. Um, there was a lot more that developed uh, over the early 20th century, but a convenient place to pick up the thread is in the 1960s where there were there's a work in ethology uh, study of uh, animal behaviors uh, and Conrad Lorenz was a leader in that uh, and Lorenz had this idea that there was an innate drive to aggression uh, to aggress against others and that there was also, and this is often overlooked when people talk about Lorenz, a program of militant enthusiasm, which is set to trigger the violence against others. And the examples he gave uh, sounded an awful lot like uh, Germany in World War II, where he actually was in World War II. He was in Germany then. Um, others came along. Um, Robert Dart was uh, a paleontologist who worked in 
southern Africa uh, and found many skulls that had breaks in them, which he interpreted as being signs of cannibalism and therefore of killing. Our ancestors were all Australopithecine ancestors uh, were cannibals. Um, there were other people working along these lines. The thing that gave it a real boost was uh, writings by Robert Ardry, who was a playwright and screenwriter. And he and he's a fantastic writer. I mean, it's hard to put him down, even if you want to. Um, and he wrote about he took all of these ideas. He took Dart. He took Lorenz and others. And he came up with a very um, uh, dismal view of humanity, although he would not think it was dismal. Um, he thought war was a good thing. Uh, war was responsible for most of the progress humanity had made. But it's in the nature of people, maybe just men, to want to go to war against um, each other's. Um, that was very big in the 1960s. Uh, Ardry was a very popular writer. It showed up in such things like the film 2001. Ardry was an inspiration for that. Um, William Golding's Lord of the Flies goes along with it, although my understanding is that Golding wasn't directly inspired by Ardry, came up with it on his own. It was in the air. Um, anthropologists hadn't done much on the subject of war. It was something that we had avoided for years. That's another question why. But in during Vietnam, people felt that it was incumbent on us to say what it was that anthropology had to say about war. Now, this wasn't the first time it happened. Uh, during World War II, um, Bronislaw Malinowski wrote about war. During World War I, Franz Boas wrote about war. But they were kind of isolated papers. It wasn't part of a general focus. There were ups and downs after this time period of the late 60s and early 70s and how much anthropologists worked on war. Uh, but Ardry was generally discredited. I don't think there's any, well, I'm, I won't say that. Uh, I don't know of any who are still defending Ardry's position. Like Richard Wrangham, uh, who is someone who is a great theorist and who I uh, write about a lot in the book, said one of the big differences between what Ardry said and what they have learned from chimpanzee studies is that Ardry thought we learned to kill other conspecifics, others of our own species, because we had developed a kind of instinct for hunting. And Wrangham reversed it, uh, that our ancestors learned to hunt because we had tendencies to kill others of our own species. But it wasn't Ardry. It was, although he sometimes uses the word killer ape, which was Ardry's. Uh, and it's going on from there. And there's many others of these. Um, I'm writing here about the work on chimpanzees, uh, but uh, there's a great amount of work in evolutionary psychology and other fields, too. So it's a, a wide field. And it seems to be very popular. This is one of the reasons I'm motivated on this, is that when I talk to people who aren't academics, uh, as one bartender said to me one time when I was talking to him about it, he said, it's, it's that whole Darwinian thing. Uh, and that's out there. Uh, and so I have tried to challenge that with different work. I tried to challenge it in relationship to tribal warfare, which is said to be over that. I tried to challenge it by looking at the archaeological record. And this is the culmination of about 22 years uh, off and on, work on the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear and to state clearly what we're talking about here or are going to talk about here today, mm -hmm. uh, how would you define war from an anthropological perspective? Well, I had one definition, but I've changed it as a result of writing this book. And the definition was something that a lot of other anthropologists don't agree with. I wanted to define war in its most minimal sense. Uh, so basically my definition is some version of when members of one group combine and go and take action that involves killing members of another group, that would be war. Now, by that def now the reason I did that is that I didn't want to have people say, as is sometimes said in current debates with other scholars, 
that uh, they say that war is a recent invention because they've defined war as such in such a way that it could only be recent, like it involves territorial conquest. I don't have that. It's just a very minimal kind of thing. <clears throat> it distinguishes war from homicide, for example. Individual homicide, we know that goes back as far as we have fossils. Um, but it involves some kind of coordination directed at some others who are not members of the same group. That's been my definition all along. But when, and by that definition, you can say, do chimpanzees make war? On occasion, they have. And there I would dif disagree with some of my anthropological colleagues. But when I made that definition, I was thinking of people only. I was thinking only of human beings. And so I left out two critical aspects, which I elevate as central in this book, which is um, uh, symbolic uh, understandings and cumulative development of uh, innovations. Those chimpanzees don't have. I can talk about it more at the end if you want. But for that reason, I would say chimpanzees do not have war. And in the book, although it's not in the title, it starts on page two, when I refer to chimpanzee war, I put it in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. So getting into chimpanzees directly then, and let's go perhaps through the several steps you take in the book uh, about the history of uh, studies that have been done on chimpanzees, different chimp troops and groups uh, in Africa particularly, and that perhaps have been misinterpreted in some ways. So uh, starting with Jane Goodall's uh, work. So initially it seems that she portrayed chimpanzees as uh, mostly peaceful, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, before I say anything else, I want to say Jane Goodall is my hero. Uh, she came through incredible adversity and through determination, uh, gave us some of the biggest revelations about uh, humans' place vis-a-vis -vis other animals in uh, the animal kingdom. Um, she did produced one of the greatest books, I think, in 20th century uh, science, The Chimpanzees of Gombe. And um, since then, she's done incomparable work uh, in great causes. But I also see Jane Goodall as a scientist, a great scientist. And science progresses by taking ideas, evaluating them according to new evidence that has come along. And there's been an awful lot of new evidence since then. Um, so her initial portrayal um, was quite different from as we understand chimpanzees today. When she first went to Gombe in 1960, uh, she was alone or with her mother and sister, uh, and she did a lot of observations from a place she called the Peak, which was Gombe has a lot of open land, unlike some chimpanzee habitats, which is very dense foliage. So she could sit up in the peak and look at chimpanzees. And when she went there, when she went there, uh, the game warden, or I'm not sure what his title was, of Gombe for the government, had told her that chimpanzees had different geographically localized groups within Gombe, and told her where they were. When she watched them from the peak, she saw groups coming from those different areas, which met and mixed, and sometimes there was a lot of uh, excitement at first, but then they would settle down and they would feed and they would mate and <clears throat> sometimes they would go off together. Uh, she also witnessed chimpanzees from that she recognized by this time as individuals from one local group within the centers of the areas of other local groups. And she came to the conclusion that these were not uh, bounded groups and that the only thing that would separate two chimpanzee groups from intermixing would be some kind of geographic barrier. Um, that was the initial impression. It was also the initial impression of a contemporary of hers, Vernon Reynolds, who was working at the research site in the Budongo Park. Uh, and they seem quite consistent that chimpanzees are localized, but they mix. Um, then that changed. Then things happened and understandings happened. So this kind of 
peaceful idea. I mean, Chim Goodall was a great communicator saying chimpanzees were rather like us and us like them, except that chimpanzees seemed much nicer than people and that they didn't make war. Then things changed in what I call the Great Revision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what uh, led to the so-called, or what you call then, the Great Revision? Well, Goodall's history of research in Gambia, when uh, it, it carried over from 1960 to the late 1980s, so it's a long time. Um, but there were different phases of it. And at first, she um, was unable to get close to chimpanzees at all until she discovered, quite accidentally, uh, that she could get them to come to the camp where she stayed by <coughs> leaving out bananas for, with them. Uh, they loved the bananas and they'd come and then she started leaving out more and left them out all the time and they came and came and came. So, so far so good. Now she was able to observe chimpanzees. They wouldn't run away anytime she got close. Uh, other graduate students could come and did come to help her there so she could go to England and do her studies. Um, she could go do other research projects. She could do lectures. So she was there less of the time, but they were feeding a lot of bananas. Um, it was getting to the point where chimpanzees could, uh, one chimpanzee could consume 50 or even 60 bananas in one sitting, which is a lot. Um, I came to an estimate, I'm going to shy away from numbers as I'm talking to you because I just can't keep them in my head, but it was about 3,000 calories a day averaged over the whole group they were getting from bananas. <clears throat> but this led to a great deal of fighting. And after she came back from a period away, she was shocked at how much the chimpanzees seemed to have changed. Uh, when the bananas were put out, there would be a lot of pretty vicious, but not deadly, fighting among them where one chimpanzee would try to hoard as many bananas as he or she could, uh, mostly he, uh, and others would fight over them. And it was getting really bad. Uh, Richard Wrangham wrote one of his first published articles on this banana provisioning that came out in 1974. <clears throat> and he, just, he, he cites a personal communication from Goodall saying that if they couldn't do something to cut down the violence, uh, along with banana feeding, they would have to stop the project, or they might have to stop the project. Uh, and there was also violence between chimpanzees and um, and baboons, which started coming in great numbers. So they wanted to stop the violence, and they, they tried different systems. I, there's systems A through E that they tried over a few years <coughs> to distribute the bananas in a way that wouldn't lead to this free-for-all of competition. Um, the first ones didn't work. The chimpanzees were ingenious on getting at them. They, they could put chimpanzees, bananas rather, in a box that had a spring on it, and the chimpanzees figured out how to pull out the hinges on the box. Um, so they settled on system E, was they dug a trench and made a kind of a concrete bunker with trap doors in it. Um, that they could spring open, bananas would be behind them, the chimpanzees could smell the bananas, but they couldn't get at them, and they would only open them uh, when there were few enough chimpanzees, so all the chimpanzees there could get some, and they wouldn't fight over them. And this worked pretty well. The violence dropped off considerably. Uh, it led to a, a great nutritional cut for the Gambe chimpanzees, but the violence between the chimpanzees at the feeding station and between the banana and between the uh, baboons and the chimpanzees uh, went way down. Um, so that happened uh, in, I think, 69. I'm not sure. Or, I'm not sure quite that date. Uh, 69 or 70. Um, this then led to other changes. Uh, the violence over the bananas stopped, um, but the chimpanzee interest in coming to the research site also dramatically declined, or declined. Um, the group that they were studying before this change, they named um, uh, Kakambe. These names are named after streams that go in this highly uh, gulchy area. 
Uh, and Kokambe chimpanzees were from groups that came from the south, Kahama Valley, and from the north, Kasakela Valley. But they seemed to merge around this banana feeding. Um, with the bananas cut back to about once a few bananas once a week, the southern Kahama chimpanzees drifted away, went back to the south, didn't come in very often. Uh, when they did come in, they were always fed because they wanted to attract them back to the station. <coughs> but relations between Kahama, which were now seen as two different groups, they had fissioned, although my own opinion was that it was one group that came together temporarily and then went back apart, that the um, Kahama chimpanzees uh, went back to their southern ranges. And what they also did was they, whenever the northern, the Kasakela chimpanzees, their old buddies, started to go into the southern ranges, the Kahama chimpanzees would dramatically chase them away. So the circumstances were that there had been this glut of calories from the bananas. Now that was cut down uh, and the Gambe, the, the northern group, uh, even after it had lost this cal caloric intake, was now being chased away from what had been their rangelands to the south. This is the circumstance that led to the four-year war. Mm -hmm. So the four-year war then, uh, what was it exactly? The four-year war, this is a term that Jane Goodall came up with, mm -hmm. is um, a series of violent altercations and at least some killings between um, Kasakela and Kahama, and also of external females from unknown origin by Kasakela. They also attacked and killed external females. Um, and it went from uh, 1974 to 1977. Uh, and what happened was, uh, well, originally the, what became known as patrols and are a very big part of primate studies now. Uh, a patrol, chimpanzees will move as a group, they'll move, they'll make a lot of noise, they'll feed, they'll socialize. A patrol is different. It's usually uh, a, uh, a line of file with um, a, usually males only, very quiet, very tense and alert. So at first, it was the Casacala, the northern chimpanzees, who started going on these patrols when they went into Kahama lands because they were, being af they were afraid of being attacked by Kahama. So that's the way the patrols are said to have started there. Um, but in some of these patrols, they met a, a single uh, chimpanzee. Most of the ones we're talking about are male, but there was uh, uh, a female, uh, Madame B. Um, and they were attacked, uh, brutally attacked. And we know, at least the way I count things, and I can talk about how I count later on, <clears throat> at least two adult males and Madam B, the female, were killed in these attacks. And there were three or four others where a killing is possible but not certain. Uh, and that occurred over four years. Now, we don't have the same detail about all of them because one of the things that occurred in the middle of the four-year war between 74 and 77 was Goodall's research camp was raided by uh, rebels from the Congo across the lake. And they uh, captured and took hostage uh, some graduate students. At this point, Goodall and her students were removed from Gombe, uh, but after a period of chaos, they could resume observations with the, uh, the Tanzanian research assistants who they had trained. The first part of the war very well described because there could be 20 graduate students here at one time. The second part is much um, less well described uh, because it's done by fewer people uh, at the ex the people who had been her trackers. Um, and as the uh, when the Southern Kahama group was completely gone, the Northern Kasakela group 
began to go into their southern territories, which made it seem like war, destruction, and conquest. And that was the beginning of what we see as the understanding of chimpanzee intergroup behavior today. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm going to ask you about now is a recurring theme in your book. We're, go we're going to get back to it later on when we talk about other chimp groups. Mm -hmm. But uh, how would you say then human activity created and shaped intergroup tensions leading to this war? Well, two primary ways. Um, okay. One is by, um, and, and this is something that's, you know, when you look at any scientific debate, it's interesting what gets passed along in the uh, telling of the stories and what gets dropped out. One thing that was pretty much agreed on by Gombe researchers at first is that one factor that led to this was loss of chimpanzee habitat outside of the park, surrounding the park. So it was believed by graduate students uh, and Jane Goodall subscribed to this idea that more chimpanzees had been forced into the park because of this loss of land, rangeland outside. Um, but as Goodall said in one discussion, it didn't seem to explain the, uh, the, what, what appeared to be a real desire to kill that they witnessed in some of these attacks. And, and these were chimpanzees that knew each other. So there was some kind of other thing going on. Well, I'll come back to what she thought. Uh, what I've added is actually, it's, it's, I have to credit the originator of this view, Margaret Power, uh, wrote about uh, Gombe and said it had to do with the banana provisioning. Now, I agree with her, although I disagree on how and specifics of that. But basically, I look at the bananas, which um, Gombe researchers thought they had solved that problem with System E. Um, but, and, and this is something that really needs to be clarified, because I know what's out there is the idea that uh, provisioning, that my theory is provisioning causes intergroup violence, causes, quote, war. It's not. Uh, it's uh, provisioning itself, and I'll go into how this works at a more theoretical level in, in a bit. Provisioning itself uh, is a center of attention, contention, uh, but at Gambe, it wasn't the provisioning that led to the war. The provisioning actually brought the two groups together. Uh, what it was was the great cutback in the provisioning, that chimpanzees that had gathered uh, in the same place, socialized, uh, now we're finding that their um, supply of what had become their staple was drastically curtailed. And I've got s information, and one thing I'll say in general, uh, for anyone who's listening to this, is I can talk all I want to here. The, it depends on whether I have the facts to back this stuff up. And that's why the book took so long, and that's why the book is so large. Well, everything, you know, it's, talk is cheap. Um, I'm saying things that a lot of people who, if they listen to this and haven't seen the book, are going to say, oh, that's ridiculous. Check the book. Um, I never go more than one or two steps away from empirical fact. Um, and I've got evidence that this cutback in provisioning led to a drastic loss of body mass among the Gombe chimpanzees. Uh, at the same time, the ones from the north were being excluded from going into the south. And at the same time that the ones from the south, Kahama, those few times they did come to the feeding station were always fed in sight of the Casacala chimpanzees. Um, the Casacala chimpanzees could see. It was an open area. Um, they would chase the local males away and get bananas every time they came. Now, this was the, uh, I think, the pointed conflict between these two groups, which once had been, you know, socialized together. It wasn't just that. Um, 
there are other things. These explanations are complex. Uh, I can go into these more sometime if you want, but there was a, uh, a matter that there was sex in that uh, the uh, at the point of the four year war um, was uh, that there was a, a shortage dearth of sexually cycling females uh, and Casacala males went out looking for females that they knew were out in the area around them. So that brought parties out. Um, there was political conflict, which I will talk about later on in relationship to display violence. So these were other factors that went into it. And the great revision, uh, which came to say that chimpanzees uh, could be just as mean and nasty as people, wasn't just because of the war, the four year war itself. At the same time, something happened that Jane Goodall said haunted her dreams, which is that one of the Casacala females began killing and eating female uh, children, infants of other females within Gambi and did it several times. This was hard to imagine. And there was more violence, uh, which I go into the in the book, more internal violence, other kinds of violence. Um, what I surmised when I put it all together was that the Gombe chimpanzees had been kind of socialized to a more violent way of getting along. Then they had this great impact on their resources, their the bananas included, which uh, had a major impact on their uh, diet. Um, and in a way, that pit one group against another. And that's something I'll return to several times. It, it can't just be scarcity or abundance. It's, do the circumstances create a severe scarcity that leads one group against another? Mm -hmm. uh, and what aspects of how chimps deal with territoriality do you think are important for people to know if they want to have a better understanding of uh, what happened here? Well, chimpanzee territoriality is something that um, was debated, then that debate just kind of went away. Um, I'll t I think we're going to be talking more about standard idea about territoriality when we get to human hunters and gatherers and things. So some mm -hmm. I'll uh, wait for that to put it all together in one. Um, but th the standard idea was that there was a, a kind of a uh, bisexual donut shape in chimpanzee territoriality. A female stayed in the center of a range and males uh, prowled around it, a circle around them, a ring around them, which kept other males from getting access to females, male re uh, reproductive competitors. Uh, and that's why the males would come in contact with uh, males from other groups. Um, but this has been so, when you look at all the chimpanzee work around Africa, there's, I think there's more exceptions than illustrations of the rule when you see it. And like one thing is that when the, um, go, the Casacala males went out in their patrols, they seemed to be searching for what were called peripheral females. Peripheral females were not in the center of this donut. Uh, they were in the donut or beyond the donut. Um, so the standard idea of, of, social, of territoriality is this kind of female center, male ring around them, and that's why two male rings will collide, they'll, they'll kill each other. Uh, but I, I don't think that that's a, a very uh, reliable uh, view on chimpanzee sociality now, or territoriality, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned earlier, this war occurred between 1974 and 1977. And mm -hmm. historically speaking, this is a very interesting period in science, particularly in the evolutionary sciences, because uh, I'm not completely sure about the year. I think it was 1976 or 77 when sociobiology by, by Edward O. Wilson mm -hmm. got published. And there was the rise of sociobiology as a discipline that then led to the development of evolutionary psychology in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, what aspects of how Edward O. Wilson and others theorized 
uh, within the field of sociobiology do you think were the most relevant when uh, it gets to how they interpreted data from chimp studies? Okay, so um, you know, sociobiologists, they, they, few people will call themselves sociobiologists now. It's, it's got other names for reasons not necessary to go into. Um, he uh, named it and popularized it. Um, and it was also known as not exactly the same, but pretty the same, the selfish gene theory. And this idea was that to understand life on Earth, you had to look at it as in a Darwinian sense, which meant uh, competition and struggle to pass along genes to the next generation. That's what everything seemed to boil down to. Now, what uh, expanded sociobiology greatly was that uh, this notion of inclusive fitness because we could see in, in many animals behaviors that seem to help other animals that did not necessarily help themselves to live or reproduce so how to deal with that well inclusive fitness and a related concept of kin selection meant your close kin your brothers and sisters share your genes um, you share 50% of your genes with a full sibling. Um, so if your siblings reproduce, your genes are reproducing. So you can be altruistic to your siblings and may not, and may lower your own reproductive success, but if you help them, you help your own genes. And this was really the, you know, firing go and everybody took off after this. Um, Goodall was not a sociobiologist. Um, if you look at Wilson's book, Sociobiology, you'll find discussions of chimpanzees, but not about this violence in war, which had not yet been known. Um, and Goodall has actually given some statements where she seems to be pretty put off by some of what she sees as uh, reductionist views of sociobiology, that everything comes down to the currency of the genes. Um, but people who came after her, uh, people such as Richard Wrangham, such as Michael Gilieri, such as many others, basically assimilated as graduate students a sociobiological perspective. So as the theory developed, uh, it was more and more dealt with in the currency of the genes and competition and conflict uh, between groups and individuals who were less closely related to each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you tell us then also about uh, two other concepts like interference mutualism and coalitional aggression and what role they played here? Okay, coalitional aggression, they're, they're, they're different, not just in specifics, but in their orientation. Mm -hmm. um, Coalitional aggression, uh, I know some primatologists uh, object to that term. I don't. Uh, coalition, coalitional aggression or coalitional behavior uh, means that two or more individuals will work together uh, to some common end. And the coalitional aggression is basically if two or more chimpanzees gang up against one chimpanzee. The numbers tell the story. Um, so that was something that uh, had been in common use before any of this theory began to be developed. Interference mutualism is, and, and this is, I think is, a, you know, Richard Wrangham, uh, I'm very critical of Richard Wrangham in this book, uh, but I'll tell you that this guy has been a really great and to me inspiring theorist. He's really worked for years to develop theories step by step and undertake research projects to investigate them. I disagree with these theories. That's a lot of what the book is about. But he's a great theory builder. And so he came up with interference mutualism. Mm -hmm. um, mutualism is something which you will find very, very common in discussions of evolution today, much more so than it was in the past. Mutualism, um, so like a coalition is two individuals will cooperate to one goal. It's the shared goal. Mutualism 
doesn't get into intention. Mutualism is just behaviors that if two individuals do the same thing at the same time, they both get more if they did it separately. So a, a simple example would be uh, chimpanzees hunt monkeys uh, and eat the meat. So if several monkeys, I'm sorry, several chimpanzees hunt monkeys together, they'll all be more likely to make a catch than if they did it individually. Um, whether they're cooperating is another big debate, which I won't go into here. Um, but that's the idea. Uh, mutualism is simpler, just common behaviors towards uh, a common but not necessarily intentionally shared goal. Uh, what Rangham did with interference mutualism is he put a sociobiological conflict struggle spin on this which is that the, the standard idea of mutualism is uh, two will benefit, and so they'll do that. Interference mutualism means, yes, that, they'll benefit, but it also hurts others that aren't part of that group. It's not just that it benefits the doers. It hurts the ones who are excluded. Um, so you would do something that would help you out, but at the same time would make it more difficult for your competitors to get along. And that goes along with things that were later on developed in his theory as it built, as Rangham built it up step by step. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us now about the imbalance of power hypothesis and how it combines things like male philopatry and fission fusion association within the group? Okay, so um, I'll do the. Philopatry and fission fusion first, and then okay. the balance of power. So, um, okay. philopatry is a the idea that male philopatry is the idea that in some species uh, that um, when mating occurs, when when sexual maturity is attained, the females will go to another group, the males will stay stay in their natal group, and they will mate with not marry, of course, mate with females that come in from a, a different group. Uh, the females move at maturity, uh, the males stay home. Um, this was, now, this was originally thought to be something that was unique to chimpanzees and bonobos and humans. They don't think it's unique anymore. They found a lot of other species that do this kind of, no, I'm, let me stop. I got to go back here. You don't have to stop, stop. But uh, let me uh, do the, um, what was the other one you asked about? Uh, yeah, imbalance of power hypothesis. Oh, oh, but, but you were uh, perhaps you're referring to fission fusion. Right? Fission fusion, you got it, yeah. right. Male philopatry with fission fusion, uh, they go together. So that's the idea that you know, some groups of animals that are social animals will always be with everybody else. Uh, but some break up and come apart. People do, uh, chimpanzees do, bonobos do. So any day, any hour, the chimpanzees who are together may be some large part of the total social group or some small part. Um, the idea with male philopatry combined with that is that whether they break up or come to, whether they're broken up or coming together, they still share these genes. Uh, so this is something that provides a common, uh, a kind of uh, basis for what is seen as the imbalance of power that the males of one group, and this I haven't said yet, and it's important, phil mm -hmm. male philopatry is taken to mean that the males of one group will share genes with each other more than they share genes with the females who come in from elsewhere, or more than they share genes with males in other groups around them. Now, if you take that, that the philopatric group, the male core, is genetically more related than to others, then that means when you have a, uh, a contest between the two groups, any group, any individual is a representative of the gene puddle uh, of the local group. Um, and so if you've got more males who are related, even if they uh, disperse, um, there'll likely be more of them that'll encounter males of another group, with less genetically related, um, and this leads to the imbalance of power idea. So the imbalance of power idea is in one way completely non-controversial. Um, in imbalance of power, it simply means that 
if there's a conflict situation, uh, especially when it's a serious conflict situation, numbers matter. Um, if uh, whatever species, if one individual attacks three individuals, it's not going to do so well. If three individuals attack one individual, it stands a much better chance of doing okay. That I agree with that. I don't dispute that. The imbalance of power idea, however, went further than that. And the imbalance of power idea, um, the, the key distinction is that what I just said, you could say a <coughs> superior numbers... Uh, three versus one, is a necessary condition to initiate an attack. But in the imbalance of power idea, the way it's developed here, it's also a sufficient condition to attack. There doesn't need to be anything else involved. It doesn't need to be conflict over resources or a female at a particular moment. It's just the opportunity to kill members of the other group. That's what's important, because by philopatric males in a fission fusion pattern, killing fission fusion philopatric males of another group, every time they kill one of them, they have one less male defender. So in addition to the killing incidents that occur, chimpanzees also have collective I, battles is okay, I think. They'll, they'll fight in groups over which stands of uh, certain kinds of trees, for instance, with, uh, with droops on them that are highly nutritious. And there'll be lots of chimpanzees charging back and forth and screaming. In those, if you've killed some of the males of the other group, if you've killed them, they've got fewer in those direct contact con conflicts over resources. So that's the logic of uh, an imbalance of power being sufficient to kill. It gives you advantages uh, in the long run in overt conflicts over resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the dominance drive? Well, the dominance drive is something that's it's a little harder to answer. It was developed most, most prominently in the book Demonic Males. Hasn't been used much since then, although it occurs. Uh, it may occur not as a dominance drive, but it may be stated like uh, in explanations of inner city street gangs, uh, assumption that male... Um, quest to increase their status compared to other males as a human universal. Well, it, it's not using the words dominance drive, but that's basically it. And the idea there is that um, human males, or and chimpanzee males rather, and human males, uh, have this innate tendency to want to dominate over other males. This fuels the competition for status elevation within the group, to become number one, to become the alpha. Uh, and there certainly is a lot of that in chimpanzees. Um, but in demonic males, it's said that this is also um, turned outside in a way maybe analogous to Freud's death uh, drive, that, that you, you have this competition within the group, but you use it because you want to dominate others, other groups as well. Um, and that this is something that fuels the competition with other groups and in a way that resonates with kind of standard international relations theory that a situation that is prone to war is when there's one dominant country that's being challenged by another country that's rising in its dominance. Well, that moment is the tense moment for, for war between countries. So it's, a, it's a, an idea that's out there in other uh, contexts as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so before we talk about another hypothesis you also mentioned in the book, how did this all get extrapolated to humans, particularly hunter-gatherer societies? Well, the dominance drive... Um, only got half, well, didn't really get a, didn't really get transferred whole to humans. Um, it is when it comes to uh, urban street gangs, 
according to their theory. <clears throat> but in terms of uh, hunter-gatherer groups, it's been obvious for a long time that uh, status is egalitarian, more or less, but it's not, you know, they don't have alphas. Uh, and more work has demonstrated that over the years. So that part's just kind of left out. But what stays in, as far as I can see, but what stays in is the idea that they want to dominate the other groups. That's still there. Uh, and that leads to the uh, tendency of people to go to war, even if there's nothing tangible material at stake. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us now then about the resource competition hypothesis alternative. So this is something that I found very useful in writing. One of the things that's a little difficult uh, when you're in this literature is that many hypotheses come up, are named, and then kind of disappear. Um, there was uh, an article uh, written by Ann Pusey and uh, uh, Wilson, who was a student of Rangham and uh, now a very respected major primatologist in his own right, and somebody else I'm forgetting, um, to try to analyze data systematically from Gombe, mm -hmm. and they framed the alternatives as uh, the rival coalition reduction hypothesis, which we haven't mentioned yet, mm -hmm. and the research competition hypothesis. Now, the rival coalition reduction hypothesis is almost the same thing as the imbalance of power hypothesis. It's, there's some fine distinctions. We don't have to worry about them here. But the rival coalition reduction means that chimps are going to take any opportunity to kill off members of the other group, as I just explained. Um, nothing else has to be at stake. Resource competition hypothesis is something that is different and that it says um, that the what's at stake is actual competition over important food or maybe mating resources, but food's mainly the thing that's talked about. Um, these led to different predictions. So the rival coalition reduction hypothesis would say uh, when they meet an enemy, kill it, where the resource competition hypothesis would say just drive it away. Uh, the rival coalition hypothesis would say kill outside males, don't kill outside females, they're potential mates, Resource competition <coughs> would say drive females away too because it's over resources. Now, there's a another distinction in this kind of fine thing. This is the kind of thing people scratch their head and say, why, why are these guys talking about this? The, the difference between these two things is very important for understanding theories of human warfare and things like ethnic conflict situations. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of theories, they're often called primordialist theories, in which people just want to dominate the other and kill the other and exterminate the other and uh, just because they're different, because they're not us. Uh, and the resource competition hypothesis would say, well, if two groups are doing that, you got to look at what they're fighting over. So when it gets to people, uh, it's, it's very important. Um, and the rival coalition hypothesis, I had a note on this, what was it? Um, oh, yes. I, it, for me, that distinction leads to another important consideration in chimpanzees. And that is, um, when I talk about human impact hypothesis, uh, I'll go into this more. But mine is, if what you... If my view of the, and I subscribe to the resource competition hypothesis, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you show that better if you can demonstrate that some important resource sources, food or what I'll be talking about more, preferred foods, are in actual intensifying uh, scarcity leading up to the violence. With the rival coalition reduction hypothesis, it's almost the, the opposite. If there's more food, they'll still kill each other. Um, so <clears throat> I use these two throughout the book just because in all these different theories that are out there, I can 
put that label on them and carry it through and people can know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and how does the resource competition hypothesis combine with the human impact hypothesis? Good, thank you. The um, human impact hypothesis is what uh, I'm, this book is going to be known for. Uh, and it has a, a number of different manifestations. It's basically that if you want to understand um, deadly violence among chimpanzees, you have to put them in historical context, meaning look at what is going on in their interaction with people in their environment. Mm -hmm. It's not the only source of history. I mean, a drought can be as well. Um, but that's what I, I look at. Um, and the what I find is that um, the resource competition that is followed by deadly violence is in most, maybe all cases, preceded by some form of human action that intensifies the resource competition, as we saw at Gambe. So it's with the banana provisioning being cut back. So it goes with the resource competition hypothesis, but it historicizes it and says, why do you have this intense conflict at this particular place? Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, another hypothesis. You've already alluded to it earlier, the display violence hypothesis. Right. What is it about? This is going to come as a surprise to a lot of people. A lot of people have known about the human impact hypothesis for a long time. I've been talking about it, but this will be a surprise, I think, because this is something that um, was forced on me by doing the research. Um, the resource competition plus human impact uh, worked to explain the main thing that I started off looking at, which was what people call war, two groups of adults fighting with each other. But as more and more I got into it, and the longer time went on, because since, I mean, I started work, the first thing I published on this appeared in the journal Foreign Affairs in 1999. Um, so it's been a lot of other stuff since then. Um, oh, don't let me forget my, to mention my webpage. But I got a lot of other stuff there. Uh, but I've been doing it for a long time. And, and so a lot more research has accumulated. And more of the research, uh, in more recent years has a lot of internal violence, particularly, but not exclusively, internal killings of infants, sometimes by females, mostly by males, including males who, by other circumstances, may be the fathers of the infant that they kill. Uh, and this has repeatedly included what are referred to as bizarre behaviors. Like the male not only kills the infant, but bites its head, smashes it, jumps up and down on it, pulls bones out of it. Uh, the word bizarre appears in different research sites at different times. Um, that didn't seem to fit with uh, what I was doing. And um, what I eventually developed as an idea that when uh, there is a situation of uh, th there's certain circumstances that are, are facilitative of this. A high degree of status conflict within the group. So it's the status hierarchy is uncertain. Now, this often is related to human disruption, but not necessarily an important emendation. Not necessarily. Um, there is that. Uh, there is uh, often a belligerent personality that's involved um, and the opportunity to kill without risk to oneself. What I, I it's a very short step um, from what is common knowledge in primatology that males will use very aggressive displays to intimidate rivals as part of them getting to the top or defending their status high up in the hierarchy um, they do this a lot, and I'm saying that what we see in some of these bizarre manifestations of violence are actually displays to intimidate 
potential status rivals. And one of the ways I show that is by going into the details of what's happening when these displays occur. And what they seem to always involve is a lot of other males standing around and watching <clears throat> the dominant male doing this performance of violence. Um, not restricted to infants within the group, but there's a lot of that. It's a factor in some other situations too. The other part of the status-related violence is when um, is what I call payback violence. When you have a male, uh, it's usually uh, a one that was an alpha and has since fallen, but not just any alpha, a particularly obnoxious, belligerent alpha. You know, some alphas are very diplomatic. Some are just brutal. When you have one of the brutal ones and it has fallen, what you see again and again is people, people, the, sorry, the uh, chimpanzees that uh, it had uh, brutalized before, bullied before, will take the opportunity to attack it um, and often kill it. Now, they also has the result of driving a fallen alpha into exile which is one of the things that goes into considering whether a disappeared chimpanzee is a dead chimpanzee. Uh, but they may kill it. And um, that is uh, something that I think is, uh, it, well, I came to this conclusion just as my book was really done at the very last minute. I've got, I've got a very awkward long footnote at the beginning and at the end to a, a, a comment like this, uh, Christopher Bohm, an anthropologist who also worked with chimpanzees, came up with a very similar theory. Um, and I'm agreeing with him there, uh, came to it independently. But I think that because when you look at chimpanzee war, I mean, one of the things we do when we look at chimpanzee violence, we tend to, the discussions are almost always about these groups of males attacking males from other groups. Mm -hmm. And that's not most of the violence. Uh, there's a lot more violence of other sorts. Plus, even at Gombe during the four-year war, if you just go by the record, it seems that males killed or may have killed more outside females than males, which doesn't make sense from a reproductive point of view. You want those females to mate with. Mm -hmm. but, but our views are very limited to uh, the things that we can transfer over to human warfare. Mm -hmm. So, to sum things up a little bit here, when do chimpanzees resort to violence? Well, when do people, you know, I don't think you can really come up with a formula for that. Um, one of the things that will frustrate a lot of people, I'll get a lot of criticism, I understand, is that I don't come up with sort of a formula uh, of these factors, these variables. Uh, I've been studying human war uh, since the Vietnam era, uh, and I don't see any kind of formula at all for predicting human war or certainly other kind of violence. Uh, my approach is to, it draws on in what in social sciences is called comparative history, is to look at situations um, that are violent and, and try to understand what is going on with those lives uh, and try to one uh, identify what's important to them like you know now they're fighting over these stands of fruit trees when they didn't do that before you know but it will be different in other circumstances i don't think that um I, I look at chimpanzees and bonobos. I'll talk about bonobos later on. The bonobos don't kill chimpanzees, do. You know, what's to explain the difference between them? Well, it's complicated, uh, and there's a lot of factors. With chimpanzees, like the Gombe War, it was the resources, but it was also, I think, political disruption that was going on. The first uh, violence, deadly violence against uh, Kahama involved Humphrey, a male who had just been deposed, as alpha uh, and he led the attack which i think was trying to regain some cred but there was also the searching for peripheral females 
if they hadn't been looking for peripheral females, there might not have been any war. You know, that, you know, it's not what I emphasize and why the war happened, but take that out. And also uh, big throughout the book, I talk about individual personalities. I think they make a difference. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap up this part about the Gombe War before we move on to Mahale and the K group, mm -hmm. uh, after the war, how was Gombe changed? Uh, well, this is, um, this is another part of the standard story. When you talk about Gombe, you get the four-year war. You might get also what was called the invasion from the south. That's when a, a third group, Kalande, which was further south than Kahama, moved into Gombe territory. Um, that was supposed to, uh, it's, it's often said that that involved killings, uh, and it was supposed to mimic the conflict that existed before. I don't think it didn't involve killings. At least we don't have any solid evidence that it did. And this is one of the things that I do a lot in the book. I said, you know, well, you look at what's said here, there's really no evidence that there, there was any males killed or infants, more but not conclusive. Um, and then that ended. That ended in 1980. Um, well, that was 42 years ago. And when you hear about Gombe, you don't hear about the next 40 years. You don't even hear about the years before. Uh, the four-year war, you know, 1960 to 1970. You know, that, that's half a century of observations <clears throat> that don't register for us. Mm -hmm. It's understandable in some way. The, two, the chapter on the, what I call the post-war years, was the most difficult to research and write, and I think that a lot of people are going to get to it and they're going to skip um, because there's different groups, many different factors, changing over decades, uh, what there is not is anything resembling the four-year war. There are a couple of cases which are said to be external adult killings too, um, but I don't think I have a different interpretation of them, which is in the book. But otherwise, there's a lot of internal fighting. There's generally, I argue that in the before the mid 1990s, when human impact human impact comes in all different forms, habitat loss, um, uh, disease, tourism, um, it was less intense before the mid 90s, and there were fewer killings. And the ones that did occur were associated with a couple of particularly brutal uh, adult males. Um, Goblin and Frodo. <clears throat> and then after that, uh, there were more killings. And so the information, and this happens to, in a number of research sites, the information we have about these sites kind of goes dark by the mid 2000s. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Gombe now. I, I see, I see some, re most of the reports I see are using reanalyzing data sets that go back many years, but not what's happening now. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that is clear, just by because these things get mentioned, there's been a lot of killing of infants within their own group. So it's, you know, it's when I'm showing human impact leading to war uh, or, or setting the stage for status related violence, I'm limited by what contextual information I have. Uh, a lot of the ones that look most unexplainable for me have very little information and there's very little information to work with in the past well 15 years at Gombe something like that um, but it's uh, from the little I can see it seems like a pretty messed up situation but I'll, I won't stick to that because I don't know <laughs> but but do you think that there might have been any issues with how the killings were counted well um, the killings of count yeah that's that's a good thing and it ta will take us to Mahale too um, mm -hmm. a big thing in this debate is how many the numbers um, there have been many tallies over the years uh, and there's probably been five, at least, different counts of chimpanzee deaths. Uh, 
internal, external, male, female. <clears throat> I've um, set up my own system of counting. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, it is similar, very similar to what other people have used. Uh, I give these things a number, one, two, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. Uh, a one is an absolutely positive killing. That's where they see the attack and they see the chimpanzee die. Uh, a two is one beyond reasonable doubt, which is pretty close to that, but they just don't have, you know. Uh, a three is a, a likely killing, and that's where uh, a very severe attack that could result in death is observed, and then the chimpanzee isn't seen anymore. But the body's not found. A four is a situation like a three, except there's <clears throat> some question about it. Like there seem to be some sightings of the chimpanzee alive after it was supposed to have died. The big difference <clears throat> is in five. Um, for most, like most primatologists, um, they would my one, two, and three uh, would be a positive killing. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't really object to that. I'm, that's, we're pretty close. Um, what I call a four, um, a possible, is often called inferred in their mm-hmm. case. And I don't really have a big problem with that either. Very often in the book when I'm doing summaries, I will say all killings from certain to possible, from one to four, um, I'll be talking about here in my totals. The difference, the big difference is in... Uh, their category, their category three of a uh, suspected killing, uh, because unless I, most of these are driven by the paradigm of expecting that a chimpanzee that has disappeared is dead, uh, and that it likely was killed by other chimpanzees. I disagree on both of those inferences, uh, and I will call these hypothetical killings because it's more the hypotheses than the evidence that we also uh, can you know agree to disagree on because in the the major statement of uh, the uh, adapt adaptationist perspective an article that came out in nature I think in 2014 worked by a lot of primatologists you've probably seen that um, they don't count their suspecteds just like I don't count the hypotheticals. So we're dealing with a very similar set of numbers. One difference is, though, that especially in the beginning, um, not so much since then, when it, the first versions I was working on in this book put a lot of emphasis on this, but much less since, is that the death count has been exaggerated uh, by inferring certain deaths when there's reason to doubt them. Uh, this was particularly the case for the invasion from the south. It will be the case for Mahale coming up. Um, so that's one difference. But otherwise, uh, if you look at the, the state of the art published tally, which is in the article by, oh, I should have this in Wilson and uh, Wilson and Rangham and um, the two. <laughs> I'm getting old. The two Nago- two Nagogo researchers. Um, sorry, people. Um, that I have more in my counts than they do, um, and that's because uh, they stop about 2013, mm-hmm. and I have more since then. And also because when I read the literature, any time I saw someone in an article say, "I suspect." that that chimpanzee died or was killed, I count that. So my numbers are actually greater than theirs because uh, some of the ones that I count didn't make it into their their list. Mm-hmm. But that becomes particularly important for the case of Mahale. Right. So let's get into that case then. So how were things there and what happened exactly? Well, Mahale is critical. Um, Mahale is another research site. It was uh, run by mainly by Nishida. Uh, it was some hundred and some miles south of Gombe uh, along the lake shore and similar kind of environment. It was an independent study. 
uh, and Japanese researchers brought their own concerns and their own methods. Now, what was central for the development of this, what I call the Gombe paradigm or Gombe vision mm -hmm. of seeing this as being normal behavior, it was first the four year war. And then you got the invasion from the South, which was interpreted as being, you know, four year war two, but I, I think is different. Um, Mahale seemed to be from another place, but the same thing happened. There, there was K group and there was M group. Uh, these groups were provisioned with bananas as at Gombe. And the, over time, uh, it was inferred that M group killed off the adult males of K group and took their territory and their females. And this followed hot on the heels. It was actually just about the same time as the four year war. Um, although I think the final goes up to 1983 or something like that. Um, and so the verdict was in, this is normal behavior. It didn't happen just once. It's happened three times. When you look at the Mahali literature closely, what you see is that in early discussions of population, some adult males have disappeared. Uh, the researchers weren't there for 12 months. They'd be there for three months and they go away and they come back and one of the males wasn't there. They didn't think much about this because chimpanzees actually adults disappear quite frequently for many chimpanzee groups. I didn't think much about this. Um, then when they came back, uh, and this is, I think is where deep research is necessary. I found a, a newsletter that Nishida had written in <clears throat> and he wrote there, it's quoted in the book, that the news from Gombe made him reconsider these disappearances and think they might be deaths. Then there was three or four, again, the numbers are um, subsequent disappearances of adult males. And then the females uh, and some juveniles and even an adolescent male of K group assimilated into the larger M group, which took its territory. Now, if when you get to the book, you'll see uh, practically a whole page of people saying <clears throat> at Mahale, one group exterminated another. Well, there's no evidence of that. Um, the first killings, supposed killings were, as I said, unsuspicious. If you look at the next three or four, as I do in detail, there's nothing there to indicate that they were killed by members of the other group. The strongest evidence for an intergroup killing, and this is the strongest evidence at Mahale, is that one researcher heard a ruckus far up a valley that could be two chimpanzee groups meeting uh, or one chimpanzee group attacking a single male. Um, and after that, one of the older M uh, K group males wasn't seen again. That's it. Now, at the same time, there was a leopard prowling at Mahale uh, that attacks chimpanzees. And as I said before, there's uh, this pattern of uh, adult males, former alphas going into exile after they've fallen and been attacked. This chimpanzee was one of them. So there's no real evidence. There are two intergroup infant killings, um, but the evidence for the the war there uh, is, is nothing really. And I'll point out that the uh, Japanese researchers themselves, they put out a, a massive book a few years ago. Um, they doubt the initial story of a war. They, they think just what I'm saying here, that it was interpreted that way because that was the kind of interpretation that was going on then, but the evidence doesn't really support it. What they say, you know, th this leaves you with a question of, well, so why did K group disappear? And um, first of all, K group didn't disappear. If you leave the males out, the adult males out of it, it actually merged 
with M Group. Um, but they say that that happened because of an uh, unsustainable demographic structure among the male population of K Group. Uh, that there just weren't male infants born. There were few male infants to start, and they weren't born. And there was one that was born died uh, of other causes. Uh, so they see this as just a, a, a group that male, its male members couldn't sustain itself, not that they were killed off in a war. Now, there was later on in Gombe, or and sorry, in Mahali, there was a, uh, when you go on, because I've got two chapters about Mahali. One mm -hmm goes through whether or not there was a war. And I say no. The second goes through their whole history. And there, there could have been adult killings at Mahale. And I say it could have been because in some ways the situation was like at Gombe, that all of the conflicts that occurred were around the banana and sugar cane feeding stations. And it might have been uh, that one was killed there. We just don't have any evidence that that happened. Um, after that, Mahale was gone. Um, there were other chimpanzee groups around uh, M group. There's no re no reports of patrolling. I think in the total history of Mahale, there's like two or three cases where they say we saw something that looks like a patrol. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Uh, and the relations with the other groups didn't seem to be anything worth writing about. Uh, the there were a lot of internal infant killings. This is the best set of data for display violence by alphas. And there were a couple of alpha payback killings too. Uh, but no war a la Gombe for your war. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, and I think it's important for me to ask you this question because yeah. I think it might complement the previous one where I asked you about how killings were counted uh, at Gombe. Uh, in this case, do you think that there could be particular cases where disappearances could have been interpreted as killings or not? Yes, yes, that, that's what Nishida did. Now, Rangam, I'll give him credit that he, Rangam's been more skeptical about this count than others. I believe in, I'm not sure in which of the, tallies they do, that he counts these, all these males as, um, as suspected, uh, mm -hmm. and I would count them as hypothetical. Um, but a lot, it, it, it is, and I think this is going to be part of what's going to have to be dealt with uh, by the field of primatology and the public who's interested in science, how certain so many people have said was the string of adult killings at Mahale. Mm -hmm when it, it just doesn't have evidence for it. It's possible that one happened. There is no evidence, though. Uh, they were interpreted as killings, and that's why Mahale seemed to confirm the Gombe perspective. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you now about Kibale, uh, and in the interest of time, I w I'm just going to ask you about that, but you I can also... But you can also mention Budongo and Thai if you want. But uh, I agree with you. that. Would be a four-hour interview. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll just do Kibale. Um, Kibale is the next most important case. Uh, I think probably more important mm -hmm. than certainly than Mahali and even than Gambe because at, at in Gogo there were two groups that were that was studied by research, independent researchers. The Ngogo group in the center of Kibali Park and the Kanyawara group on its uh, northwestern fringe. The Kibali group is the most important because in the mid 2000s, um, something happened there. There's no provisioning. Um, there is no immediate around Ngogo, there is around Kanyawara, but there's no immediate human settlement touching on the Ngogo group. And what was seen were, were lots and lots of territorial clashes uh, on different sides, in the southwest, in the northwest, but of most important, the northeast. And uh, 
Kibali chimpanzees were followed uh, over a period of about five years, uh, and they witnessed many attacks on chimpanzees from other groups, both infants and females and adults. And there were uh, many clear-cut killings. Uh, and the uh, uh, I, I agree with that. And then what you got was um, the Ngogo group moved into the territory that had been also used by their northeastern neighbors, and the northeastern neighbors weren't seen there anymore. So this is interpreted as conquest. So you can't attribute it to provisioning. Um, the This is going to be, and, and I'm going to do this briefly because this is an, a, a real example of how you've got to, I can't say it any simpler than I say it in the book. Um, I go along with the findings of the Kibale researchers in almost all points. Um, an important one is that they, they say, and I agree, that the reason that the Kibale uh, chimpanzees that they were following were able to kill with such effectiveness and impunity was that there were so many of them. You know, chimpanzee groups can go from 20 to 80, you know, sometimes more or less, but Kibale had about 150. Uh, if you see film from uh, Kibale of some of the attacks, and they have it, it's like this army of male chimps uh, rushing forward and catching an individual. So, yes, that's why they can. Um, where I... And I, I don't even know that I dis they disagree with me because they said things that have uh, Watson Matani are the two guys I forgot about before um, uh, who, who signed that article in Nature. Um, Watson Matani uh, say that the chimpanzee group has, has grown in numbers. My position that is my position that um, this increase in numbers has happened over a definite time frame from the 1970s uh, up to the beginning of the killing. And there are factors that led to it. And the key factors are intensifying habitat loss all around Kibale Park. Uh, now, if you see a map of Kibale, I think one of the things that people find interesting is the redrum maps that I have in the book of Ngogo research areas, I'm sorry, of Kibale. If you see maps of Ngogo, what you see is like a dot in the center of this big C. It's not a dot, it, it's a big area. So there's only room for like one more chimpanzee group between it and the park exterior, which has been heavily impacted by human beings. So I'm arguing that this external input impact drove chimpanzees inward, compressing ranges and also directing females into that area. They were able to live there because there was a staple fruit, a kind of a ficus that was, um, that, that never went short. And this was planted by human farmers uh, back a century ago. So that was their kind of bread and butter, but it wasn't their their preferred foods, and this is something I use throughout the book, the difference between an adequate diet and preferred foods. Some foods are clearly preferred, but uh, sugar cane, for one. But also monkeys, uh, they eat a lot of monkeys, and uh, also uh, certain groups which have are very nutritional, like uh, Uveriopsis congensis. Um, these are limited. So while there is... Ngogo has an adequate diet, no doubt about that. Uh, there's plenty of stuff to eat. The stuff that they like to eat, the stuff that they make most of the effort to go after, is not unlimited. It's short, and it is contested, both between Ngogo and the group on its northeast, and others who are between Ngogo and the park border on their southwest. So when you see Ngogo bulge out 
in the Northeast, which is seen as the conquest of the Northeast, what you also see is them being pushed in on their Southwest. Um, so this is essentially my argument uh, about Ngogo. Um, like I say, it adheres largely to the, I, I, I think there's a lot of primatologists uh, who, if I read what I, if they read what I actually say, instead of getting some kind of a caricature of it, will find it reasonable. Uh, and because it looks at things they look at, you know, food, scarcity, things like that. But it just puts them all in motion. Kanuara is different. I'm going to, that's the other one. I'm, I'm just going to skip it for time. And also because that could be the most controversial discussion of the book. And I'd rather leave it for that. Um, if you got another question about Ngogo, I'll answer it. But the, let me see if I, I made some. Kanuara, uh, Budango is fascinating. I do every research, every major research site. One of the things when I was initially working on this book, someone said, well, why don't you just pick one site and do that instead of doing them all? I said, I got to do them all. And if I don't do them all, people can say, well, what about that place? So they're all there. And, and also, important point, every killing that I could find reported is there. This isn't a case of sampling error or uh, confirmation bias. There's no sampling. Every case that's reported is in this book. Um, so there are other cases to look at, too. The one I will mention, though, uh, and I won't go into, but on the um, Atlantic coast, the site of Loango in Gabon is really strange what's going on there. Um, suddenly, a, a lot of killing and strange behavior, like chimpanzees attacking gorillas, killing a gorilla infant. Um, what's going on? Uh, of territorial estimates that just don't have anything to do with the way chimpanzee territorial behavior usually is mapped out. Uh, Part of it, I think, is global warming, which I think is really a factor there uh, because of something called vernalization. I'll, I'll leave it at this, that if temperatures don't drop to a low enough point uh, over the course of the year, flowers won't bud and so fruit won't set. And in Luango, the low temperature is 69 Fahrenheit. That's, you know, it's a hot place. Um, but the temperature's gone up by a couple of degrees in the past few years. And at another nearby site, they show the fruit production has cratered in this area. And it's not just chimpanzees that are going after it. It's also gorillas and elephants. And if an elephant wants to eat the fruit first, it wins. You know, but gorillas are going after the same food, and now gorillas and chimpanzees are fighting. So it's, I'm not going to say more because it's, a real puzzle, but we're going to be hearing more about uh, that place. Mm -hmm. So before we move on to the bonobos, I would just like to ask you a sort of general question just to try to wrap things up about the mm -hmm. chimpanzees. So uh, what would you say are the factors, the things people should look at when they're studying chimpanzee societies and particularly when and how they resort to violence? Well, this is where my answer is going to be very unsatisfactory for many people, maybe you too. Um, it's a difference in approach, is that I don't start off with a set of factors that could be looked at, like at um, in uh, the, the article by Wilson and Matani and Watson, Bragham, uh, they have a human, a human impact variable. Uh, that they measure, and they find that it doesn't have anything to do with when violence occurs. N none of the factors that go into their human impact variable uh, pertain to what I'm arguing. I mean, the factors that, and I, you know, com is this science or is it not science? A comparative historical approach, in my view, uh, is a form of science in that it takes case very tight comparison of similar variables in comparable cases um, and posits relationships between them in those cases 
and see if it works out in the different situations. I did that when I studied warfare among tribal people of the Pacific Northwest or when I studied the Yanomami of Brazil. I study all cases, same factors, but the factors are developed by studying the area. I don't walk in with them in hand. Um, when uh, I started studying the Yanomami, I was just kind of exploring. And then I found that this issue of access to steel tools, once you saw it, it was all over the place. And that's what my uh, explanation tended to come up. So I, I don't have, what, if you want, how I would look at these things is uh, you try to understand the way well, if it's people, it's people, but if it's chimpanzees, what's going on in their lives and how it's changing over time in ways that make a difference in their lives. What are the factors that do that? Uh, and what um, doesn't matter? Like provision, um, many chimpanzees have lost limbs or digits to snare wounds. In some places, it's a quarter of the population. That's disruption. Um, but that doesn't do anything to pit one chimpanzee group against another. In some areas, chimpanzees <coughs> have been killed because a human war came through and they were killed for meat. That's disruption, but it doesn't pit one chimpanzee group against another. If you, I try to find out, my basic method is in historical anthropology and this is look at where there are conflicts, find out what the history of that area is, what's the relationship between the history and um, so, but in this book, I identify like a big thing is one really big thing. It's not as part of the uh, nature article uh, variables is habitat loss in nearby areas, not where they live themselves, but near to them. Um, if you had to go through everything, uh, that's probably the most significant uh, of in the most cases, but it's not in some others. Mm -hmm. So about the bonobos now then, uh, how do they differ from chimps in terms of their sociality and where do those differences stem from? Does it have anything to do with biology, with ecology or what exactly? Both. Mm -hmm. um, starting with bonobos, and I'll try and keep these answers a little shorter here because it's Anyone who's stuck around this point must be figuring that there's something better to do. <laughs> um, that there's a, um, chim uh, chimpanzees and, and bonobos overlap in virtually all their behaviors. What, what one species can do, another can do, and they differ in frequency. Um, so there really is a bonobo pattern, a chimpanzee pattern, <clears throat> but it's not exclusive. It means that they're capable of doing what the others do. For example, one of the things that you will often hear is that bonobos, and this is important, I'll get to it, mm -hmm. don't form uh, factions of males that uh, for like coalitional aggression. Mm -hmm. Well, in one case they did. Uh, group E2 at Wamba uh, did that. Uh, but generally speaking, no, they don't. So uh, they overlap. The, the one, uh, bonobos are very different in that they will let uh, other bonobos, male bonobos, uh, enter their group even permanently, um, adult male bonobos. Chimpanzees have never been seen to do that, although it's been close. So in at least one case, you've got an adolescent stranger male joining it at Mahale, and he rose to be alpha. Um, but the big difference is that bonobos do not kill, um, at least as we've seen so far. It doesn't mean they never will. I think that they have the biological potential to do so. There is biological difference. There is ecological difference. But I think the intervening variable that has to be brought to bear is social organization, um, that chimpanzees and bonobos have a very different social organization. Um, it's 
chimpanzees have a social organization where it is possible and uh, almost obligatory for males to bond with other males in these uh, aggressive coalitions. That rarely happens among bonobos. Why? Because in bonobos, there's a, starting with the ecology, and I think everybody agrees on this, from, from me to Richard Rangman, everybody, the underlying condition, at least in the early bonobo studies, is resource abundance. Uh, there's plenty for them to eat of the things that they like to eat. Um, when there's been resource scarcity, uh, or when, when there's been human impact, uh, it hasn't been as important. I mean, one of the things that I point out here is that when they started giving bananas to chimpanzees at Wamba, they did start to act like the chimpanzees at, Goba, at Gombe, but they didn't continue on that curve to violence because for reasons I explain in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that. There's the resource abundance. Another thing that I think is going to be more controversial, although it's based on established facts, is um, there is a and, – and it leads to questions of what we mean by evolution in a biological sense. Mm -hmm. um, the chimpanzees uh, – bonobos are said to be, um, relative to chimpanzees, paedomorphic meaning that they retain uh, juvenile characteristics into adulthood in many aspects of uh, their physical bodies. One result of this is a different orientation of the, the vulva in bonobos. Um, and there are illustrations in the book. The difference is that uh, female bonobos can perform genital genital rubbing uh that is they rub their uh, uh exterior genitals against each other and some seem to have orgasms orgasms i don't know i've never asked a bonobo myself but it's um seems to be the case um chimpanzees have done that on a few rare occasions what the illustrations show is that their bodies just don't go along with it uh like Two chimpanzees will grab onto a tree and face butt to butt at each other, where uh, a female bonobo just lies down and welcomes another female on top of her. So physiologically, it's very different. It's very easy. Now, the relationship between GG rubbing and there's like different variables, GG rubbing, association, alliance, and agonistic support in a conflict. They seem to be related, but not clearly. The bottom line, though, is that female bonobos will gang up when a male attacks another female or one of their infants. And as a group, they will defeat that male. So in chimpanzees, that works. Can't do it. Uh, with bonobos. The way to be a reproductive success for a male bonobo <coughs> is to hang out with mom. Uh, mom gets you into feeding situations, introduces you to her friends. Uh, that's the way to do it. Not to hang out with other guys. That won't work. Um, so you, you have a status hierarchy, but it's a bisexual hierarchy, and it doesn't involve males competing as groups with other males. <clears throat> that, I think, is one of the essential things in what I call display and payback violence. doesn't exist among bonobos. And it's because of a social organization that has developed over eons into what becomes a bonobo pattern as contrasted to a chimpanzee pattern. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's one type of violence I haven't asked you about yet that you also refer to in the book. Um, what are the main adaptive strategies theorized to explain sexually selected infanticide? Well, I, I don't want to go into to that much. It, it's mm -hmm. um, the, the debate over sex. One thing is time. Sexually mm -hmm. selected infanticide is a long debate independent okay. of uh, chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. For many years, chimpanzees were thought to be the case that doesn't fit. 
There have been many efforts to make it fit. And one reason is that uh, a, a bottom line condition for sexually selected, sexually selected infanticide, basically, in its simple form, is that a male will kill infants if that will make the female more ready sooner to uh, mate with him. So that if he's replaced in a couple of years by some other intrusive male, his infants will already be partly grown. Doesn't happen with chimpanzees. It's, 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 not, um, it's not like that. Uh, and the baseline condition for sexually selected infanticide is that there's got to be no chance that the male kills his own infant. Uh, doesn't That cancels it. There's, there's a lot of evidence that they do among chimpanzees in different places. Um, so I address that in a whole chapter, the sexually selected infanticide argument, just to talk about this point, but also because when you when you look, I pull up one of my papers here, wait a second, a number. Um, in my count, of all killings um, of uh, ones to fours, that's certains to possibles, uh, in all different research sites, there are 63 of adults, adolescents, and juveniles, and 99 of infants. So more infants are killed uh, than adults. And so I had, I separate out my summary talking about infants, which is largely in the display violence explanation and uh, adults. But to go into it more, it, it would be time consuming. Mm -hmm. Right. So just before we get into more of the human aspect, human war and all of that, mm -hmm. just one last question, because I think this is also important to get to mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, are most killers and victims male? Um, they are male. Um, uh, that's that's the the strong suit in, and one of the things I say. I mean, the um, I mentioned this Nature article from 2013 that supposedly drew, uh, drove a stake through the heart of the human impact explanation. Well, I in uh, my part nine go into that in great detail. And uh, I disagree with that uh, requiem. Um, one of the things I found is that what is cited as supporting the adaptive strategy position is not what was originally predicted. So, for example, absolutely yes, more men or more males, that's easy to do. Uh, more males uh, kill than females. But it was supposed to be females don't kill at all. And females do kill. Um, usually of infants, but it happens. They've also joined in in coalitional attacks. At, at Thai, the female joined in an attack, and not only did it help kill another male, but uh, ripped off its uh, genitals and ate them, um, which is the only kind of uh, cannibalism on adults that I know of. Well, there's one of my other ones. Um, but yes, uh, that's, that's definitely the case. But the original prediction was only males, not females. Um, the other side of that prediction is who gets killed, uh, who is killed. And the numbers are, oh, I've got it right here. Um, I think. Yeah, in external fighting, uh, of adults, 52 males and 12 females. These are my figures. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in um, infants, when the sex is no, known, 31 males and 24 females. So yes, um, that's where they can find it. But the original prediction, the, basically adult chimpanzee males shouldn't be killing any females, especially not any female infants. Mm -hmm. Not female infants of their own group, because sometimes they don't leave, contrary to the male philip project pattern. Um, but anyways, they were not a threat 
uh, to the males. Certainly not females of other groups, but they do kill females of other groups. Um, the direction <coughs> is supposed to be exclusive, and instead it goes to more than more and less. That's not the original sociobiological calculus that was applied here. And I look at other things that are all the predictions in that Nature article are are examined and uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. So for this last part of the interview, I would like to ask you, of course, about human war and specifically a little bit about the paradigmatic case of the Yanomami. So how has the demonic perspective been extrapolated to human warfare? Well, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the bridge was built quite strongly, and demonic males, in that uh, foundational book, uh, Rang and Peterson say that uh, if you want to see how human war among simple societies uh, relates to, is, is informed by chimpanzees, look at the Yanomami, that's your best case. Um, many of the things that they say in there were wrong about the Yanomami, like they said that the Yanomami have a male philopatric pattern like chimpanzees do, they don't. Um, uh, the the, the outmarrying of females that developed among the Yanomami uh, was a development with missions, basically, uh, you know, kind of ironically, uh, uh, male relatives seeded females to people at missions so they could get contacts with the missionary source of Western goods. But in traditional Yanomami society, it doesn't exist. Um, the idea in the Yanomami, well, you know, I wrote a whole book uh, on the Yanomami, and my, by looking at every case, the, step back. The basic explanation for Yanomami warfare, as it developed by N Napoleon Chagnon, <clears throat> was that um, males, sure, males will compete for material resources, but there aren't any to compete for among the Yanomami. When there aren't material resources to compete for, they will compete for females. Mm -hmm. And that's what the fighting is about. And they will then uh, fight over revenge because revenge is a kind of reproductive strategy because it means don't mess with me and or I'll kill you. Um, well, those don't work when you look at every case. When you go from an anecdote, you know, here's one that illustrates what I'm saying to all of them. Um, so Chagdon, in one of his main theoretical statements, talked about two different conflicts. Um, gave some detail on it. If you go into those conflicts and you see, well, actually, one was about over a woman, uh, but it didn't lead to any violence. Uh, another one was violence, but had no conflict over women involved in it. So that explanation, I said, didn't work. And the explanation that I tried was a historical one. And it put Yanomami warfare in context of dealing with an outside world that went through centuries of different manifestations. Um, but in more recent times, like when field work was done among them, uh, the main source of contention was the conflict over access to steel tools and other Western manufactured goods. Now, these goods seem to us like nothing. Who cares about red cloth or glass beads? You know, but it's very important. Our cheap commodities become great status symbols, and in the case of steel, necessary means of production. Uh, and they're not distributed equally. And so what I did was I looked at where and how Westerners impinged on Yanomami territory. And then I looked at things like when Yanomami villages move or when they split in two and, and when they fight and came up with a set of specific predictions about war. And this is what I call in my work, um, what I mean when I say I explain war. And that is what I explain is times of great war among the Yanomami among Yanomami villages and times of little or no war 
among Yanomami villages. And I explained what kind of village attacks what other different kind of village. Um, that's the general explanation. If you get into the specifics of an action, then you have to get down to personalities, things like that. Um, I, I will take this moment to mention, because of that uh, paper, uh, anyone who's interested in this, I would recommend that you go to my website because it's uh, not algorithmically attuned. You won't find it very easily. But it is R. Brian Ferguson, lowercase, no periods, dot com. And pers persevere and you'll find it. That has in it my recent article about Yanomami warfare. Um, it also has an article on masculinity. Um, and it's got a summary, uh, this, uh, this Scientific American, it's got this Scientific American article. There it is, um, which I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, which, which explains in a, a thumbnail sketch the chimpanzee work and gives you some other statistics on it. Great. So oh, and, and wait, one more. If you want to know what I think is the most relevant contribution that I've come out with of anthropological theory for understanding uh, contemporary problems of warfare, there's an article uh, a few years back called um, Tribal, Ethnic, and Global Wars. Tribal, Ethnic, and Global Wars. They're all PDFs. You know, you just click on them. Mm -hmm. So um, just one last question then, and just mm -hmm. to introduce the question uh, within anthropology when it comes to uh, approaches to understanding war, there are two big camps, the materialists who see uh -huh. war deriving from practical interests in resources and power, and the symbolists who see it more as acting out scripts of cultural value systems. Right. So, uh, and could you tell us about your own anthropological theory of war and where it falls exactly? Well, I definitely come from the materialist camp. I was mm -hmm. a student of Marvin Harris. Um, but over the years, it's, it's been very apparent to me that uh, both of these are um, absolutely essential for understanding well, both sides. And I've tried to combine them. Um, I've tried to show how uh, I, I have a... A concept, uh, well, I won't even go into that, um, but that you'll see it in that tribal, ethnic, and global wars. Um, and you'll see it also in Chimpanzees' War in History, Are Men Born to Kill? Uh, because the last part of it talks about, I mean, there's, in part, there's, there's, I don't know how many chapters, but part nine is dealing with the evidence for human impact, for, um, you know, it's, it, it summarizes everything for the adaptive strategies. Part 10 is dealing with human war. And the first chapter in part 10 looks at how this chimpanzee, chimpanzee model has been applied to human warfare and finds there's not much there, really, I don't think. Um, and then the second to last chapter is where I talk about, and this I got from, go back to the beginning, means how do you define war? You know, I, I was dealing with mm -hmm. humans only for that minimal definition. Mm -hmm. I've had my eyes opened up by looking at chimpanzees. And many people, many people say chimpanzees and bonobos uh, and other animals have culture. And I disagree with that. I believe that they have learned traditions. In fact, I take learned traditions farther than most people do. Because I, I am like... I talk about chimpanzees having gender, um, and that's part of a learned tradition. Um, but I don't see it as culture um, because of the two unbridgeable gaps of symbolic cognition and learning and uh, what's called the ratcheting effect of one invention building on top of another invention. Um, and I describe those in the second to last chapter. 
and say that this is this makes human warfare essentially different uh, from what chimpanzees do. And and this I try to bring together symbolic and materialist approaches. And then the final chapter in the book is just a tour through the work I've done over since Vietnam uh, on trying to understand different cases of, of war that all employs one consistent theoretical approach. And like I'm doing with this book too, it's uh, many different circumstances, questions, but trying to be consistent throughout. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you've mentioned your website. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box Great. of the interview. Also, the book again is Chimpanzees, War and History, Are Men Born to Kill? And mm -hmm. as soon as it's available, I will also put up a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Ferguson, uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. I've been following your Equal. work for a few years and I'm, I've been a really big fan. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Love hearing it. Uh, great talk, great interview. You were a really excellent interviewer. So, um, okay. Well, people, see you around somewhere. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider making a pledge on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gerbo, uh, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windiger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, and Morton Eichland. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardas France, and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all. <laughs>